Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. We're going to continue our series on the armor of God. And today we're going to specifically get into the individual pieces of armor, starting with the belt of truth. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse number 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then beginning with verse number 13 down through verse 18, I'd like you to read it together with me. And the words will be on the screen if you need them as well to follow along. And so let's read them together. Wherefore, take on to you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's bow for prayer. Father, once again, we ask that as we open up your word, that you would open it to our hearts and to our lives. We pray that you would teach us how to put on the armor of God every day as we face the challenges of this world. And may today we learn the belt of truth and how important that is. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the Bible uses this object lesson, this visual illustration for us to understand what it is that God wants us to do as we go out into the battle of this world. And he doesn't want us to put on physical armor, <clears throat> but he does want us to put on spiritual armor. And so <clears throat> each day as we get up in the morning, as we begin our day, we ought to take time to put on the armor of God. Whoops, sorry about that. We ought to put on the armor of God. And so each piece of the armor is important. And so the first piece he uses is the belt of truth. Now, when you think of a belt, there's a number of purposes for a belt. And the first one is that the belt holds everything together. Turn over, you put a marker in Ephesians chapter 6 and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want you to look at verses 13 through 16. 1 Peter chapter 1 and beginning with verse number 13. The Bible says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashion yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorant, but as he which has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. The Bible says to gird up the loins of your mind, to, be, to gird our loins with truth. We need to put on truth. Now, a belt, uh, we wear a belt for a number of reasons. One is we wear a belt as a fashion statement. It's something that we like to choose that makes us look good. We also wear a belt uh, to hold our pants up to make sure that they don't fall down. And uh, that's the idea when we think of a belt is that way. But for a Roman soldier, the belt would have been very different. By the way, I think we have a soldier in the back. Do we have one of our young people that shows what a Roman soldier looks like? I'm not sure if they're set up in the back or not. Andy, can you check on that? Uh, I'm not sure if they're set up in the welcome center or not. I think they're probably not ready for that. We'll do that at the next service. But the Roman soldier, the belt that he would wear and the belt that the Bible is talking about would look something like this. It's a belt that had more uh, to it than just holding up your pants or holding everything together. It is a belt that would protect the area of the loins, and it was a belt that would be used to hold up. Uh, it was connected to the shield. It was uh, uh, connected to other things as well, and it was something that the soldier would use to hold everything together. And uh, a belt is, uh, first of all, the belt of truth is we need to be honest. The Bible says that we're to have our loins girt about with truth, and that means we need to be honest with God. In John chapter 4 and verse number 24, the Bible says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the first thing we need to do if we're going to put on the belt of truth is that we need to be honest with God. You see, we worship the true God. In John chapter 4 and verse 22, the Bible says, you worship, you know not what. 
Uh, and then down a little further, it says that we worship the true God, the living God. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20, it says, We know that the Son of God is come and hath given us understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And so we need to start by being honest with God, with the true God. You see, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me in John chapter 14, verse number 6. And we need to realize that the only way to heaven is the way of truth, and that's the way of Jesus Christ. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I wonder, is there, can you be honest today with God? Do you know if you're saved? Do you know if you're going to heaven? Do you know if your sins are forgiven? In Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2, the Bible says, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world begin. You see, God, who cannot lie, has promised to us eternal life. In 1 John chapter 5 and verses 12 and 13, 10 through 13, turn over there with me if you would, 1 John chapter 5, and look at verses 10 through 13. It says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, God, who cannot lie, has promised to us eternal life through his Son, the way, the truth, and the life. And if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you have the promise of God, who cannot lie, that you are going to go to heaven when you die. And so we need to start by being honest with God about our salvation, because only the truth can set you free. In John chapter 8, verse number 32 and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And it's only the truth of the gospel that can set you free. It's only by being honest with God. You cannot trust in your religion. You cannot trust in your rituals. You cannot trust in your own righteousness, but you have to trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And have you trusted in him today? And if you put your faith and trust in Christ, then the Bible says that you have eternal life. And God cannot lie about that. You see, some people, uh, they can lie about their salvation. They can fake their salvation. They can talk like, act like, look like a Christian. But you have to have Christ on the inside. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. But you know, not only do we need to be honest about salvation, but we need to be honest as Christians. Do you know where Christians, uh, people lie the most? People lie the most in church. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 9, lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. But you know that a lot of people, when they come to church, they lie. Uh, one way we lie is through music. We sing songs like, oh, how I love Jesus. But the Bible says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 20, the Bible says, if a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath not seen, how can he love God whom he hath seen? You see, how can you sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and you're not keeping God's commandments? How can you sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and you don't love your brother? You see, we lie when we come to church. We lie when we sing songs like, I surrender all. In James chapter 3 and verse number 14, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. If you're not willing to let go of the bitterness and the anger, if you're not willing to let go of those things in your life, then you have not surrendered all to God. And we lie in church. But we not only lie when we sing, but we lie in our prayers. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 9 through 13, is what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
You see, we, we pray this prayer that hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come in heaven as it is on earth, but it's not coming. We don't want God to be the king of our lives. We don't want God to be in control of our lives. We don't want to forgive those that owe us and have hurt us. We don't want to put God in charge of our lives. And so we pray these prayers, but we're lying and we need to speak the truth. We need to be honest with God about our salvation. We need to be honest with God and not lie to God, but we also need to be honest with ourselves. In Psalms chapter 15 and verse number two, it says, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. You see, you need to speak the truth in your heart if you need to be honest with yourselves. Uh, it was Shakespeare, I believe, that said, to thine own self be true. And as Christians, we need to be true to our own selves. We need to be honest about where we're at spiritually. Mark Twain said this, a man is never more truthful than when he acknowledges himself a liar. And there's a lot of truth in that. You see, we need to realize that as, as uh, human beings, as base beings, we are liars. We lie to God and we lie to ourselves. We say, I'm right with God when I'm not right with God. We say, I'm right with my spouse when I'm not right with my spouse. And we fool ourselves and we lie our, to ourselves. And we're not honest about sin. In Psalms chapter 51 and verse number 6, it says, Behold, thou desires truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You see, we need to start by being honest inside and, and being honest. In Psalms 51, David said, listen, I sinned. It was me. It was nobody else's fault. I'm the one that did it. And until he was willing to be honest about his sin, he was never going to get victory over that sin. Go over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and look at verse number 6. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 6. The Bible says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Look at verse number 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, the word lie here, it comes from the Greek word pseudomai, where we get our word pseudomen from, when you get a false name. And uh, we like to give nice sounding names to our sin, don't we? we? We like to make them sound better than they are. You know, instead of saying the truth that what I'm doing is wrong, we give it this nice sounding name uh, to make it sound better. In Proverbs 28, 13, the Bible says, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but who could so confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. We cannot cover up our sins. We can't give our sins these nice sounding names, these pseudomens. We've got we've to say the truth. What I did was wrong, and I am a sinner. I, I, I didn't just do what was wrong, but I did what was wrong because I'm a sinner by nature and confess that sin nature as well. We need to be honest about our condition. In Romans chapter 9 and verse number 1, it says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. We need to be willing to be honest about where I'm at spiritually, my spiritual condition. You see, what we like to say is, well, I'm not really big, my belt is just too small. What we like to say is, I'm not fat, I'm just short for my size. You know, we, we like to make it sound better than it is, don't we? And, and we've got to be honest. We've got to be honest with God about our salvation. We've got to be honest with ourselves about our sin. What I'm doing is wrong. And it's not just because I did something wrong. I did something wrong because I have a sin nature. And we need to be honest about our condition of, of where we're at spiritually. And we also need to be honest with others. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 21, it says, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You see, we need to be honest when we're around other people as well. Uh, the Bible does, doesn't say having your loins girdled about with truth. You see, what we like to do is we like to kind of cover up and hide our sin from everybody else around us. We're afraid of people seeing us as we really are. Go over to Ephesians chapter 4. The book of Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 25. Ephesians chapter 4 
and verse number 25. The Bible says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We need to put away lying, and we need to be honest with those around us. Look at verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase the body on the edifying itself in love. You see, what we like to do is we like to cover up our sins and hide our sins from those around us. And, and I don't believe we need to air out our dirty laundry, but we need to be willing to live the truth. We need to be willing to be honest with people around us. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 6 and look at verse number 14. Again, it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. That word truth there is a word which means not hidden. Not hidden. And what do we do? We come to church and we hide our sin. We hide what's really going on in our lives. And the Bible says that we need to be willing to be open and transparent with others around us. And, and we don't do that. You know, when people come to church, they're not being honest. The, the truth is not being shown in their life. Uh, it's kind of like this picture here. Here's a group of people, and in that picture you see, here's one person, and I, I'm depressed. And another one, my, my marriage is falling apart. And another one, my kids are rebelling. And somebody else, I looked at something on the internet last night. Or here's somebody says, I'm struggling with addiction. Or my anxiety is just overwhelming me. Or maybe I looked at pornography, or I, I just feel inadequate. Or maybe my anger is out of control. You know, like in that picture... People come to church week after week after week, and those same kind of thoughts are in their mind, but they're hiding those thoughts, and they're hiding that from the people around them, and they're not being transparent, and they're not willing to be accountable and to deal with these things in their life, and we need to be transparent. We need to be honest with others, first of all, because we need prayer. In James chapter 5 and verse number 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, the Bible uses the word false here because we don't need to go and air out our dirty laundry. We don't need to give them all the gory details, but we need to be willing to be transparent. And we need to be willing to say, you know what, I am struggling. Maybe I'm struggling with depression or anxiety, or maybe I'm just struggling with anger, or maybe I'm struggling my marriage. And, and, and we need to be willing to be honest with others around us. Say, I need you to pray for me because I'm struggling with sin. I, I'm struggling with something in my life. And, and to be honest with others so that they can pray for you. And also go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verses 23 through 25 to hold you accountable. Not only to pray for you, but to hold you accountable. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another, provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The reason, one of the reasons that we come together at church is so we can come together to, to provide for accountability to one another. And sometimes we need to be willing to be honest and open and transparent and say to somebody, listen, I'm struggling and I need you not only to pray for me, but I need you to hold me accountable. I had one of the young men in the church came to me a number of weeks ago and he said, listen, pastor, if I'm not in church on Sunday morning, I want you to call me on Sunday afternoon and see where I've been because I want to be accountable about being in church because I've had too many Sundays where I woke up and said, I'm just not going to go today and I don't want to do that. And he provided for accountability. And, and, and you have something in your life. Maybe you're struggling with depression or anxiety, or maybe you're struggling with some kind of bitterness, or maybe you're having problems in your marriage, and you need someone that's going to pray for you, and you need somebody that's going to hold you accountable. And we've got to be willing to be honest, first of all, with God, and then secondly, with ourselves. But thirdly, we've also got to be honest with others as well. And then fourth, you've got to be honest with the devil. You got to be honest with the devil. Now, the devil's not honest with you. John 8, 44, the Bible says, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. The devil's a liar. 
But you need to be honest with the devil. You see, you need to call him a liar. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. And see, what happens so often is the devil gets in our hearts and our minds, and he says, you know what? You're not good enough. He says, you know what, you, you're really a terrible person. And he starts accusing us and he starts telling us his lies. And the problem I find with a lot of Christians is we've gotten to the point we believe the lie of the devil. And the devil says, you know what, you don't have to put up with that anymore. Just divorce him. You know what, you don't have to let your parents tell you what to do. You just do what you want to do. And those are lies of the devil. And we've got to get to the point where we tell the devil, that's a lie. That's not of God. That's of the devil. And I'm not going to to listen to it. You've got to call the devil a liar. You've got to rebuke him. You remember Jesus in Luke chapter 4 when he was tempted of the devil. Every time the devil tempted him, he rebuked and says, that's not what God says. And folks, some of you have got to get to the place where when that thought comes in your mind, that thought of inadequacy, that thought of failure, that thought that you can't do this or whatever else it is, when that thought comes in your mind, you've got to do like Jesus. And you've got to say, that's not of God. That's of the devil. That's a lie of the devil. And I'm not going to listen to it. You've got to rebuke him. You've got to cast it out in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 4 and 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You've got to cast out that thought. You've got to grab it and bring it to captivity and destroy it. You know, there's an old saying, you can't keep the bird uh, from flying over your head, but you can keep it from making a nest in your hair. Have you heard that saying? Well, here in Hawaii, it's a little bit different. You can't keep the ropes from flying over your head, but you don't want it in your hair, right? Uh, I remember one time my wife was sitting in the living room, and all of a sudden she got up and she was doing this dance like you would not believe. And she was just jumping all over the place, and she was hitting her head. I thought, what's wrong with this lady? And what had happened is one of those 747 roaches, you know, the flying roaches, you know, the big ones, had flown into the room and flown right into her hair. And, and she was not, she was not uh, very subtle about that. She wanted that thing out of her hair. And folks, when that thought comes in from the devil, you've got to treat it like a 747 roach. You've got to say, I want it out, and I want it out now. I don't want it in my head. I don't want that thought. That thought is not of God. That's of the devil. And you've got to rebuke the devil. You've got to call him a liar. And you've got to cast down those imaginations and cast out those thoughts and bring them into captivity. And don't let them control you. Go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. When you believe the devil's lies you don't want to hear the truth. When you believe the devil's lies, you don't want to hear the truth. I preached a message a while back called, I don't want to tell you what you don't want to hear. And there's a lot of people that just don't want to hear the truth because they've accepted the lie of the devil. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and beginning with verse number 9, down through verse number 12, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 9, for you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto you, any of you, we preach unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses in God also how holy and, and, and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that you walk worthy of the Lord who called you on the kingdom of glory. That's not the reference I wanted, but, but the point is... Um, I'm reading 1 Thessalonians. Let me get to 2 Thessalonians. Try that again. That was a good verse, by the way. But let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. See, that's Satan. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this God, cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. When you believe the lie of the devil, you're not believing the truth of God. You've got to rebuke the devil. 
Because when you believe his lies, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. When you believe his lies that you have the right to be bitter and anger, when you believe his lies that, you know, when you believe the lies of the devil, you're not believing the truth of God. And you don't want to hear the truth. I find people that have believed the lies, they don't want to hear the truth anymore. They don't want to be told because they've already accepted that lie. And you've got to believe the truth of God. And you've got to rebuke the devil and be honest with him as well as being honest with God. So to begin with, we have truth. And truth, we have to be honest with God. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with others. We have to be honest with the devil. But a belt not only holds everything together, but a belt is a utility belt. This is what the modern belt looks like for the modern soldier. This is something like what he has there. It's not just a belt, but it's a utility belt. It's got all these different things that he can carry on there as well when he's going into battle. And, and that's what we need is we need that, that utility belt. Uh, I want you to look at, uh, uh, listen to 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse number 13. It says, David said unto his men, gird you on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. You see, I've got here what fell just a little bit earlier. So I've got a sword. And this sword is something that you don't just carry around with you, but you gird it on. Having your loins girded about with truth, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6. But where do we keep our sword? We keep it on that belt. And also many other things we keep on there. Uh, there's so much more. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 23, the Bible says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. You know, those of you who have been around for a while, I did a series of messages about the pyramid of learning. And how that as we learn, the way we learn is we build this pyramid. The, the bottom level, that's the level of, of knowledge. Knowledge comes through facts and information, things that we learn through book learning and through me taught and things that we learn through life experience as well. And then the next level is the level of wisdom. And wisdom is the skill to use the knowledge that I have. Uh, wisdom is, is knowing how to use that information. I can know how to work on a car, but that doesn't mean I, I can work on a car. And skill comes from experience. The more I do it, the better I get at it. That's wisdom. And then the next level above wisdom is the level of instruction. And instruction is the level of discipline. It's the discipline to do what I know I'm supposed to do. A lot of people know, for example, they know they're supposed to change their oil every two to 3,000 miles. They know how to change their oil, but they haven't changed their oil in 15,000 miles because they don't have the discipline to do what they know they're supposed to do. And then finally, the highest level of learning is the level of understanding. And understanding is the ability to take what I've learned in one area and to be able to apply it in something totally different, and totally unique. Using the car illustration, if I've, if I've already learned how to change an alternator in my car, I, 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 can, figure, I can take that what I learned in that experience and, and figure out how to change a starter in my car. They're, they're very similar. They're both motors, different purposes. But if I've learned how to do one, that understanding that I learned in that experience can help me to do the other one as well. And, and that's how we grow and that's how we learn in life. And, and truth helps us with these things. Truth is where all of these utilities, things like wisdom and instruction, understanding, the word of God, these all hang on that belt of truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen to be a soldier. You know, that utility belt is a good thing to have to put all these things on there, but there's only so much you can carry into battle. There's only so much that you could do, and, and, and you don't want to be entangled again with the affairs of this life. You see, the, the truth is to realize that, you know, this, I don't need this. There's a lot of things that we have allowed in our life that have encumbered us down, that are holding us back. And we got to be honest enough to say, you know what? I don't need this in my life. I don't need this cumbering me. I don't need this to entangle me and to hold me back. So the belt is a belt that gives us, it, it holds everything together. It's a utility belt. But thirdly, the belt is for freedom. Truth is for freedom. 
In John chapter 8, verse 32, it says, And you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Back in that day, uh, the soldiers of that day, they wore kind of a, a skirt. And, uh, and, and so when they would go into battle or when they have to, would have to run or, or something like that, they would take that skirt and they would pull it up and they would tuck it into their belt. And that allowed them the freedom to run and to fight. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 46, it says, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Je- Jezreel. What Elijah did is he took his robe, pulled it up, stuck it in his belt, girded up his loins, and that allowed him to run faster. And it gave him freedom. And truth gives you freedom. It was Mark Twain also that said, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. You see, when you tell a lie, you've got to remember the lie. But when you tell the truth, you just tell what you remember. You don't have to worry about it. And, and truth gives you freedom because you don't have to keep remembering. Well, what did I say last time? What did I do last time? You don't have to worry about that. In 3 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. Even as thou walkest in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. If you want the freedom to walk the Christian life, if you want the freedom to win the battle and to, to go into battle, you've got to realize that that freedom comes when you learn to be honest. When you're honest with God, when you're honest with yourself, when you're honest with others, when you're honest with the devil, it just frees you up. It just lets all these things go. You don't have to keep hiding your sin. You know, when we're not honest, we've got to constantly be, oh, well, I got to make sure nobody sees what I'm doing. I got to make sure nobody sees what's going on. When you're, when you're struggling with these thoughts like depression or anxiety, you're always worried that somebody's going to see that. But when you're honest and open and transparent, you got freedom that you don't have right now. And some of you, you are not free because you haven't found the freedom that comes with the truth. Go to Psalms chapter 119, and we'll close with these verses. Psalms chapter 119, and look at verses 29 through 32. Psalms 119, beginning with verse number 29. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth, thy judgments have I laid before me. I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of my commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. He said, listen, Lord, I I don't want to live a lie anymore. I want the truth. And here's my challenge to you this morning. That every day when you wake up, you put on the belt of truth. And you say, today, today, God, I'm going to be honest with you. Let me ask you a question. Think about this. Don't raise your hand or anything. But honestly, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know that you have eternal life? Boy, when you know that, that sets you free. But as a Christian, are you also being honest with God? You see, there's some people you can lie to and you can get away with it. But there's one person you can never lie to and get away with, and that's God. You can lie to yourself and get away with it. You can lie to your spouse and get away with it. You can lie to your parents and get away with it. But you can't lie to God. So why not just tell him the truth? If you're angry, say, God, I'm angry. If you're, if you're feeling inadequate and, and unworthy, tell that to God. To be honest with the Lord. But you really can't be honest with God until you start by being honest with yourself. Where am I at right now, spiritually? Where am I at in my walk with the Lord? Are there things that I'm hiding from everybody else and even God? If you truly want to move forward in your Christian life, start being honest with the people around you, with your spouse, with your parents, with your friends, with other Christians. 
I'm not suggesting we air all of our dirty laundry and every little detail to every person. But we need to be willing to confess our faults so someone can pray for me. We need to be willing to be accountable to someone so we can change things. You've got to be honest. You've got to stop walking in church hiding your true self. And then you've got to be honest with the devil because you've been believing his lies for too long and he is a liar. And you've got to call him out. That's a lie of the devil because that's not the truth of God. And you've got to call out that lie. Folks, the truth shall set you free. Let's bow in prayer.